About 10 hours ago or so, our next reader posted on Facebook, in Minneapolis, literary Shangri-La, bring mittens. So, <laughs> Dinti, some of your Facebook friends were concerned for you and sent along mittens in case you need them. It is my great pleasure to introduce one of our two nonfiction mentors for this year, Dinti Moore. Um, as you can see from your program and from Majors and Quinn's book sale table, Dinti is the author of numerous books of fiction and nonfiction, as well as two writing guides on the craft of nonfiction. But because the odds are that I will never again have the opportunity to introduce a writer using these words rather than read the information in the program, I would like to use this information from Dinti's website. He enjoys living amidst the funkadelicious hillbilly hippie center of the locally grown, locally consumed, slow food, goats are for cheese, papas are for eaten, artisanal salsa, our farmer's market rocks the hills, Appalachian Athens subculture. <laughs> Which is a very fun sentence to read aloud. <laughs> The group has had a wonderful time re, uh, working with Dinty so far, both informally during last night's potluck, as well as in today's seminar, and we look forward to tomorrow's activities. If you visit Dinty's Facebook page, you will find this quote from Richard Rodriguez as his favorite quotation, a quote that I think applies to Dinty's own writing and teaching. The best writing teaches us something about the mystery of now of being alive, being wounded in the breathing world. I must be brave to remember, even braver to write. In reviewing his memoir, Between Panic and Desire, Oxford Town wrote, this book is funny, funny, funny. It is an unconventional collection of frolicsome and touching personal essays. It is literary nonfiction with integrity, and it's fun. Those words, integrity, frolicsome, touching, fun and funny, apply aptly to our next reader. Please welcome Dinty Moore. I don't think I can turn the pages. Uh, Minneapolis is a literary Shangri-La. Uh, it's an amazing place and, and you're lucky. Uh, well, you're not just lucky to be here. I think the people here are probably why it is a literary Shangri-La. So thank you for making it so. Uh, and the loft, of course, is a, is a very important part of that. So I want to thank everybody at the loft who's been very, who have been very kind and supportive in my visit. And of course, Jared, uh, the point man, who's also a good friend of mine after many years. Uh, and I want to thank the students, these two students tonight, who are outstanding but I've had the joy and the pleasure and the honor of working with all 12 of them today. And it's an amazing program, the mentor program, and they draw amazing students. And I wish I could come back, uh, maybe I'll try. I wish I could come back for all of the, all of the readings this year, uh, except I like my funky, delicious, uh, papa eating Appalachian hippie town in <laughs> Athens, Ohio. Uh, I'm so glad that uh, Jared made a point of pointing out how fun and funny my essays are. <laughs> because I'm going to read an essay about death this evening. <laughs> Oxymoron. Three things. Bullethead is barely through the door, but already I'm trying to preserve his precious time. He's a doctor, and surely someone in the lobby is sick and needs immediate attention. Okay, three things, he echoes, pulling up a stool and quickly scanning my chart. List them. Bullethead is not his real name, of course, not on his medical school diploma, certainly, but the man's head is smooth, round, bald as a bullet, and he's an ex-marine, so there's no nonsense here, no unnecessary compassion. <laughs> he, he has a ballistic precision. I like it that way, and I'm not the only one who uses this nickname behind his back. So I dangle on the edge of the examination table. Bullethead shuffles some papers, and we spend 30 seconds agreeing that the uncomfortable side effects of my prostate medication are dreadful but unavoidable. He throws around a few Latinate words and scribbles illegibly in my chart. So what else, he asks. 
I lift and angle my arm to display a patch on my left elbow, leathery like an old baseball mitt, the skin beginning to dry out and scale off. I wouldn't waste his time with something so inconsequential, but my wife is convinced that I'm developing skin cancer. The patch on my elbow shows none of the classic characteristics of skin cancer, other than being on my skin. <laughs> but Renita's family prides itself on having raised anxiety to an aesthetic level. <laughs> Bullethead scrawls a prescription for eczema, eczema cream. Now what's third, he asks. We've been locked in the room together for almost two full minutes. <laughs> And both of us are itchy to end the thing. <laughs> I've been having a flutter. I point to the center of my chest, right here for, oh, maybe three weeks. Dr. B's pen halts in mid-scribble. He raises his eyebrows, etching deep wrinkles into his wide forehead, and then leans back on the stool, as if to get a better look at this fool sitting before him. He needs to savor the moment, perhaps, so that later, when he meets his doctor buddies at the country club and he gets them howling over stories of his dim-witted patient, he will have every detail correct. A flutter. Yeah. You tell me this third. Um, yeah. You didn't tell me this when I walked in the door. I offer a shrug, a sort of, I don't know, hand gesture, and a feeble smile. You didn't think this was important. He has me there, so I do nothing. The doctor shakes his head, gets to his feet. You should be beaten. <laughs> now that, to me, when I think back to it, is a pretty funny moment, because Bullethead is a witty guy, and his spur-of-the-moment response here has all the spontaneity and surprise required of a good joke. Moreover, the moment includes the sublime reversal, essential to good comedy, the idea of a physician a healing professional beating some poor guy at just about the moment he goes into cardiac arrest <laughs> is swollen with the sweet juices of irony. And finally, there is subtext. The entire moment, but especially Bullethead's frustrated final response, speaks volumes about men and medicine, about all the thousands upon thousands of foolhardy masculine stoics before me who went to their early graves feeling pretty darn good about themselves because after all, they weren't whiny little weaklings who crawled to the doctor with every trivial complaint. <laughs> they knew how to suck it up. The more you analyze a joke, of course, the more you squeeze all the funny out of it. But I'm trying to make a point, a point about dark humor, irreverence, about the ability to laugh at grave matters. My mother knew a thing or two about dark humor. She lost her father when she was in kindergarten, a suicide. He jumped in front of a New York City subway distraught over family trouble. She lost her mother only a few years later. No one ever discusses the reason for that loss. My mother had to be tough. Life gave her no other good choices. She had this phrase she would repeat, almost like a mantra, during the worst of times. They can kick me in the mouth, she would say, but they'll never make me cry. Mom never specified who she meant by the pronoun they, and I never asked. I guess because I already knew. Her parents, her father's Chicago relatives, who pretty much abandoned her after the death of her father. Her first husband, my dad. Her second husband, a lousy man. Her children, often ungrateful the various employers who did not take her skills seriously because she was female or young or both, and anyone else who threatened the slender thread of security she was able to create for herself after the devastating loss of both parents. Part of my mother's toughness, we called it Irish humor, but in truth it seems to cross ethnicities, was to laugh at anything, fearlessly, to say the worst with a wink, to lampoon even the most sacred or startling human moments. For instance, cardiac malfunction. Bullethead, in the end, neither beats me nor has me beaten. It is worse. He has me stripped, gelled, wired, and graft. <laughs> the next 15 minutes of my no longer routine doctor's visit feels to me as if someone has flipped the fast forward button on the overhead observation camera of my life. Bullethead slides quickly out the door, barks coded instructions. The nurses halt in mid-step, pivot on cue. Within moments, Noreen is in the exam room. My shirt is off. The table is adjusted. I'm on my back, and Karen arrives with a cart. 
Some sort of liquid gel is gooped onto my chest, and now another nurse is in the room, disentangling wires quickly, efficiently, magically, and before you can say, flatline, I'm all hooked up. <laughs> back, check, back, chest, neck, and arms. This won't hurt until we pull them off, Karen promises. <laughs> the machine on the cart is booted up, and for a moment we all enjoy a brief symphony of initial beeps and squawks. Then quick as that, everyone leaves. They leave. I'm rather surprised given the gravity of what seems to be underway. I had, after all, always thought that the responsibility of modern medicine was to keep us alive, not simply to record the inevitable endpoint <laughs> for posterity. Cripes yiminy, Mrs. Moore, we're just so sorry about your husband taking his last gasp in the exam room just now. I imagine one of these nurses telling my wife when she comes to claim the body. But look, you can see on this printout where it wasn't our fault. <laughs> see that big splotch of ink? He pretty much exploded right there. You want this for your wall or something? Now understand, I had no premonition that I was about to expire until they hooked me up. But right then, everything changed. This seemed real. You know, like television is real, like ER or house. The serious machinery, the urgency of the usually wise-cracking nurses, the look on bullet, bullet heads, typically impassive face, combined to persuade me that my end time was, well, maybe not inevitable, but now vaguely possible. For five minutes or so, I'm on my back, alone in the room, wondering what the machine is saying about me. The door is open so the nurses at the central station can hear if I drop off the table, but otherwise I'm forgotten, or seem to be. All I can focus on is the music. This is a modern medical practice, high tech, with multiple physicians housed in a sparkling new suite of offices, and every hallway is wired to play a stream of classic walk rock. <clears throat> Most of the time, you aren't even aware of it, but right now I am. I'm hearing it like I've never heard music before and Elton John is singing. Don't let the sun go down on me. Don't let the sun. And I laugh, out loud laugh, kind of an awkward chortle with more volume than intended because it is hard to produce a natural laugh when you are flat on your back, attached to 14 wires, trying to keep your heart from blowing to smithereens. I chortle twice, gack a little bit, and a nurse sticks her head in the door at an angle where I can't quite see her but can hear her voice. Hey, everybody okay in here? <laughs> now that was funny too, to me at least, the fact that I should hear this ultra-sappy Elton John ballad about the sun going down at the very moment that it seems my own metaphorical life-giving ball of light might finally be plummeting into the metaphorical dark black sea. Even at that moment, I can't help but see the humor, which by the way, drives my wife insane. <laughs> Renita. The exquisitely anxious, the one who imagines that a dry patch of skin on my elbow is cancer, that a weekend cough is viral pneumonia, that the unexpected sound of me dropping a hardcover book onto the wooden floor of our second floor bedroom is actually me, dropping to the floor, dead as a stump. <laughs> Simply cannot see the humor in any of this. In her family, first and second generation Italian Catholic, from the hard scrabble agricultural Abruzzi region. You don't joke about death. You don't, in fact, even mention death. And for that matter, you don't dare even refer to any of the countless maladies that might lead to death. Yet at the same time, you anticipate disaster with every fretful cell in your body. God forbid is their ancestral mantra. <laughs> When one of my wife's relatives needs to see a doctor, the family goes into serious mourning well before the test results. The worst fears, cancer, heart failure, anything potentially fatal, are never named out of an innate belief that the mere naming of a dreadful consequence will bring it raining down upon the victim. Don't say it, the great ants remind one another, crossing themselves, God forbid. Of course, age and provenance play a role here. Renita's extended family, particularly those of her grandparents' generation, consisted primarily of first and second generation immigrants. It wasn't really so long ago that Europe experienced back-to-back -back world wars. Infant mortality and death in childbirth were tragically common. Penicillin was non-existent. It was a hard life. 
But even, it seems, as reality softened, the fear and anxiety did not. I can remember one delight-filled August afternoon when our daughter Maria and her four girl cousins were in their grandparents' side yard, chasing one another, laughing, running, wielding sticks, small branches from a nearby maple. I looked out the dining room window and saw the innocent joy of youth and summer. My mother-in-law Lucy, on the other hand, looked out the same window, saw the same children running with thin branches, and said nervously to no one in particular, Oh, I can just imagine one of them getting an eye poked out. And she could. She really could. God forbid. <laughs> Given all of the tragedy and disappointment in her life, you might expect that my mother would have also been prone to expect the worst imaginable circumstances. But so often she did not. She had a silly optimistic side at times, which seemed like a schoolgirl's belief that no matter how badly entangled life's difficulties had become, a fresh day and new sunshine would somehow sort it all out. Unfortunately, such thinking led her into both her marriages. Neither of them was a particularly good idea, though I am thankful for the first. <laughs> As for death, she seemed never to even think about it. My sisters and I spent 20 frustrating years suggesting that mom write out a will, a simple will, one that would cover the various end-of-life issues and clarify her wishes for burial. Mom spent 20 years promising that she would when the time came. There was a delicious lack of logic in that position, since under a fair number of conceivable scenarios, she would be dead when the time came, <laughs> and thus could not clarify anything. But contrariness was at the very heart of her personality. It occurs to me, of course, that waiting until the time came was perhaps her version of death anxiety a different sort of old world superstition from that practiced by my wife's fear-ridden Italian grandmothers, but nonetheless serving the same purpose. The lack of a will, the absence of any planning or acknowledgement meant my mother wasn't ready, and if she wasn't ready, well then she couldn't go. The fear of all things related to mortality has a name, thanatophobia, death anxiety. Freud was one of the first to study the matter, theorizing that people who exhibit immense concern about their own passing aren't really worried about death, per se, aren't, but are instead obsessing over unresolved childhood conflicts, no doubt sexual in nature. <laughs> Freud, of course. Ernest Becker, in 1973, finally took Freud's problematic theory and turned it entirely inside out, positing that death itself was the root of all fear. Becker asserted not only that thanatophobia is entirely real, but that many of our other obsessive fears are mere substitutes for our primary dread of the unknown. Take claustrophobia, for instance, fear of the casket. Or consider those with the compulsive need to constantly surround ourselves with friends, music, bright lights, and laughter. In the latter case, Becker suggests, our death anxiety creates the forceful need to remind ourselves at every moment that we are still alive. Even obsessive compulsive disorder, hypochondria, and various eating disorders can be linked to death anxiety. These diseases are each in their own way about controlling what happens to us or to our bodies, perhaps because we not, cannot be in command of the one thing we wish to conquer, death and what happens afterwards. My heart rate was mildly elevated, but nothing showed up on my EKG that day, Elton John's sad lament notwithstanding. Bullethead scratched his hairless scalp, gave me another disapproving look, and suggested, well, there's something wrong with you, as if that weren't obvious to everyone who had ever met me. He scheduled more tests to get to the bottom of this for two weeks hence, but I never made it. About a week later, I was shoveling snow in the driveway, heavy, wet snow that was piling up above my knees, and I began to feel lightheaded. Worse, I began to feel confused, forgetful. It was a strange sensation, like the disorientation that comes with a high fever, but I wasn't running a fever as best I could tell. While outside shoveling, I felt distinctly as if I was forgetting something important back inside that I needed to do, so I would go back inside. But once inside, I wouldn't remember at all what I was looking for. So I would go outside again, shovel a bit more. It made no sense then, and doesn't seem to make much sense even now. My arms ached a little, maybe from shoveling, but I was ready to imagine it was something worse. So I went inside, roused my wife, and suggested 
that I had better go see a doctor. That concerned her plenty, but when I added, and maybe you should drive, she turned white. So she drove, and we were both very, very serious for about 10 minutes. But even then, I could not sustain the mood. My regular doctor was off that day, out sick, in fact, which someone else might have taken as an omen. Instead, I joked with the nurse that if I was to die, if this were, in fact, my day to cash in all the chips, she should make sure Bullethead felt plenty guilty. <laughs> Tell him I lost all hope when I learned he wasn't going to be here. <laughs> I remember her odd look. The new doctor listened to my symptoms a moment or two and then ordered me right to the emergency room. You've heard these emergency room stories before, surely. I would have been in safer hands had the doctor ordered me immediately to the local Red Lobster. <laughs> the ER was an overcrowded muddle. The individual patient rooms, actually not rooms, but cubicles marked off with thin curtains, were full. So the hallways were cluttered with gurneys, scattered every which way. And the gurneys were occupied by a ragtag army of elderly men, many of them sound asleep. I was placed up against a random curtain, hooked into the central monitoring system, and then pretty much ignored. Every 30 minutes or so, at first, a nurse would walk by, take my pulse, and promise that they were looking to find me a room in the cardiac unit. But cardiac is pretty booked, they would tell me. There are 12 of you down here. <laughs> like I said, it was a heavy, wet snow, a heart attack machine. This still looking for a bed routine went on for four miserable hours until the nurses just stopped apologizing or even mentioning that I might ever be released from my hideous purgatory. Around 8 p.m., six hours into my ER visit, I finally sent my wife home, our daughter had homework to do. My heart rate had been holding steady for hours, and I didn't even feel bad anymore, just annoyed. And frankly, you can only meaningfully squeeze your spouse's hand so many times <laughs> before it starts to hurt. Despite not being ready until the time came, my mom, at the age of 86, was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, the first significant illness of her long life, and was told that she had, best case, six months to live. My sisters and I were with her when the oncologist explained the facts and timing, and that afternoon, at least, none of us found much humor. My mom, though true to form, took barely 24 hours to seemingly put all thoughts of death right out of her mind. How you feeling? I asked my mother on the phone later in the week. Is there anything you want to talk about? She acted surprised by my question, as if she had no idea to what I was referring. Why would I? There was a long silence, and then I stuttered, Well, you know, Mom, you've had some pretty big news just recently. Oh, that, she answered. I'm not even thinking about that. And she didn't seem to be. Mom took the next few months as an opportunity to revel in sudden visits from nieces and nephews. She focused her energies on determining who would get each of the many knickknacks she had bought for under a dollar at some <laughs> yard sale. If I said yes to some item, she would write my name on a piece of masking tape and attach it to the bottom. Her biggest worry, it would seem, from an outsider's perspective, was not what happens to the human soul beyond death, but what happens to the human soul's Pyrex dishware. <laughs> I don't want to oversimplify here. Whatever was unspoken by my mother, and she was a woman who always kept her deepest thoughts most private, I'll never know. But she did at times seem almost relieved to know exactly how she would die, and pretty much when. Even in the final two months, bedridden and losing weight at an alarming pace, she mostly avoided the ramifications of her condition and instead looked for ways to soften the mood. I remember her waking from a fevered sleep, calling into my sister from the bedroom and announcing, Come on now, Susie. This will be over and done with soon. Lighten up. <laughs> Some of her non-sequiturs, insisting, for instance, that the nuns who came by every day were not Benedictines, but Klondikes, <laughs> may have been due to the powerful painkiller, Oxycontin, but some of it, I'm convinced, was her drive to find the humor in everything, a drive I seem to have inherited. She eventually took to calling the painkiller my oxymoron. 
and soon enough even the hospice nurses began to call it that as well. When a very, very elderly Father Carter came to my mother's apartment to administer the last rites, my mother once again managed the final laugh. She had been in and out of a comatose sleep at that point, but would occasionally revive and sometimes seem highly animated. Father Carter was doing his very best, but his hands were shaky, his eyesight poor, and at a key moment in the solemn Roman Catholic ceremony, he called my mother by the wrong name. Oh, my mom responded quite loudly, that old priest. We all flinched, startled to see her so suddenly awake and lucid. Don't anyone worry about Father Carter, she whispered then. He hasn't been all there for years. <laughs> With that, my mom turned to my sister, standing in tears at the foot of the bed, waved and smiled, as if we had all just enjoyed the most amusing moment of the whole end-of-life adventure. Perhaps we had. Two days later, she was gone. Which proves what? Nothing, maybe. You can have death anxiety, or you can not have death anxiety, and it always ends the same way. My medical chart, the morning after the emergency room visit for chest flutter and dizziness, proved nothing as well. By every measure, stress test, ultrasound, MRI, my heart was pumping along just fine, my arteries were clear, and there was no need to bill my insurance for another minute of hospital time. Other than the slim possibility that I was reacting poorly to a new allergy medicine, I don't to this day know what my ticker was trying to tell me. Maybe just a warning shot over the bow. Laughing in the face of death is perhaps an oxymoron, like my mother's painkiller, like the term mercy killing, or a full life, or almost certain. But I'm almost certain of this. The incessant wringing of hands, anticipation of death, worrying about what comes afterwards, thanatophobia, serves little purpose except to make us faintly miserable when we should at the very least be reveling in the simple fact that we are, for the moment, alive. What I tell my wife, and sometimes she laughs, sometimes she doesn't, is that she'll die of stress long before I die of being an overweight, beer-guzzling white male. I'll waddle into the bedroom one night, trailing potato chip crumbs, <laughs> and she will have worried herself into an early grave. God forbid. <laughs> or maybe I should be careful and not say such a thing. I mean, what if I was wrong? What if I keeled over three weeks after finish finishing this reading, or sooner? How stupid would I look then? Pretty stupid, except the joke's on you, because I wouldn't care, because... <laughs> Well, because of this, I'd be dead. <laughs> Thank you.